Okay, so today we are going to start the last main topic of the course, that is the user evaluation. We already said a bit about user evaluation uh, when we spoke about heuristic evaluation, but here we are moving from, let's say, the evaluation with expert, that was the heuristic evaluation, for instance, uh, to a evaluation with users, with end user, with your target user, the target user of any application or interactive system. Uh, this will, uh, so today we will speak about usability testing and also next week we will speak about usability testing and we will have an exercise also about how to prepare for usability testing since uh, usability testing will be part of the uh, milestone number four that you have to uh, deliver uh, before the project presentation at the exam. And after usability testing, we will speak about controlled experiment. That is another way uh, more controlled, more, let's say, statistically uh, significant to uh, evaluate an interactive system, a uh, user interface with users. And again, it's about user evaluation. Uh, as always, if you have any question during the uh, lecture, uh, I have here in another screen, the chat open. So as always, feel free to interrupt me in any moment uh, during this hour and a half. So, well, just a brief recap, since we spoke about evaluation weeks ago, and then we changed topic for a, a while. So the goal of the evaluation, the general goal of an evaluation phase is to test the usability, the functionality and the acceptability of an interactive system according to different criteria, according to different goals. Uh, if you are going to evaluate a uh, sketch, will be probably uh, different than evaluating a final product that is uh, maybe deployed and used by thousands or millions of people. And the evaluation can change also according to the initial goal of evaluation, what you are interested in getting from the evaluation. So with the heuristic evaluation, you are going to, to get an expert evaluation on some specific guidelines, on some specific principle. Uh, while if you are involving user in creating tasks about the usability, you are exploring more the usability, or you can have some automated uh, evaluation for getting, I don't know, uh, the response time, the reactive time of your application, if it's good or not good, if it's working, if it's compliant with some standards and so on. So this is uh, evaluation in general that may or may not involve people at different degree. And so also different dimension and also using a range, as we have seen, of different technique. We have seen uh, cognitive through, we have seen heuristic evaluation. Uh, we also have seen a series of technique in the need finding phase. So you can use also surveys, for instance, to get some uh, idea, some uh, concept maybe for acceptability, or maybe for saying what is more understandable, version A of a user interface or version B of a user interface. Maybe doing a small videos in a survey and having those videos and some question about those short videos that show how the uh, user interface work and behave. So you can, in the evaluation, do a, a, or, or observation, you can observe how people use uh, you, uh, 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 an interactive system or a user interface and see what are the pain points, what are the things that go well and the things that don't go really, really well. So it's a very wide definition. It's a very wide concept evaluation uh, because it means basically testing usability, functionality, acceptability in a different design stage, different goal with different dimension, with different technique. So it, it's quite large, but the, the core idea is to identify and correct possibly problem or issues or changing the 
take, making different decisions as soon as possible during the process. And again, we have followed uh, user-centered, but also prototype-centered in a way um, process for which you have done some kind of evaluation in any stage or in most of the stage. So for milestone number two, you have decided as a group, maybe also speaking with other people, uh, which is the best prototype to continue with analyzing advantages and disadvantages for your both to prepare prototype. And that is uh, maybe simple and quick and maybe also dirt uh, evaluation of your prototype. You, you come up to a, uh, to a decision. Uh, also with milestone tree, that is the wireframe you have done with the help of another group uh, a heuristic evaluation that is also an evaluation that val evaluates things differently from the, the, the paper evaluation and also with different goals. And also, uh, yeah, with different goals. In the first case, you are you did this uh, simple evaluation to decide it's better prototype one or it's better prototype two. And you came up with, okay, let's choose prototype one and maybe also take some things from the second prototype because they are interesting or they cover some issues in the first prototype or is something that came up to our mind after reflecting, evaluating, maybe checking the prototype with respect to guidelines, to respect to principle and so on. It's a very, very informal evaluation, but it's a sort of evaluation we can say. And with a, with a specific goal, came up with one, of, one alternative design. Uh, then in the heuristic evaluation, you have a totally different goal because it's an expert evaluation according to some heuristic, some principle, and to come up to find problems and correct problems. So a slightly different goal, slightly different stage, different dimension and different technique as well. And if you think for, for a moment, we also did a very simple, let's say evaluation uh, last week when we applied the Microsoft guidelines to the Amazon Eco. That was a sort of evaluation, a sort of, let's say, heuristic evaluation in a way in which we discuss if some guideline apply or not. And we could have moved uh, further and, and by saying that, okay, this uh, guideline apply to uh, the Amazon Eco and it apply well, it, it apply so-and-so or it doesn't apply. And, but it needs to be applied. And so we, we could have proposed some changes to the developer, to the designer of the Amazon Eco. So a, a lot of things could be evaluation in a different way. And we already seen this uh, a few weeks ago. So we have seen that, we briefly seen that the evaluation may take place in a laboratory. So in a specific setting uh, made for the evaluation. And this laboratory could be our, our physical laboratory or as we as we did for the heuristic evaluation uh, in breakout rooms, but it's a dedicated place, uh, the dedicated time in which people come in and evaluate something. Or the evaluation can make place in the field. So you can uh, put on the internet your web application, your prototype, uh, your interactive prototype or web application and asking people around in the world, possibly your target population, to use it and to collect the data, to collect information, uh, to maybe do an interview after that usage. But in the field where the application is going to be uh, developed. So you don't ask for people to ask people for coming in a specific place or in a specific time or again in a specific uh, Zoom call or whatever. But you say the application is there, the website is there, please use it in your normal day and we will collect some automatic data and we will maybe do some interviews or some surveys and we will check errors and we will check which is the most used functionality uh, and so on. So the evolution can take place in different places and could be, as we have seen, based on expert evaluation like the heuristics, uh, it could be automated uh, like we have seen uh, when we spoke about the regulation and could also involve users. Hmm? Uh, 
with experimental methods, observational methods, query methods, and formal. Uh, they could be all of them very, very formal, very, very informal, or something in between. Uh, a question. Uh, and user evaluation is called empirical evaluation. Uh, so, so user evaluation is so end users. Uh, a parenthesis about terminology. End users are typically uh, considered, well, obviously could be considered the final user of your system, but typically they are considered as uh, people, let's say normal people, not developer, not expert in a domain, just users. Uh, so it, it's probably more general to speak about user evaluation. Because you can have a programmer, you are creating an IDE, and so you have a programmer evaluating your IDE, and that is probably yes, the final user or your application. But typically for end user, it means people that don't know how to program and are not expert in programming. But anyway, user evaluation is also called empirical evaluation because you empirically get information from um, the the users, but it's it's also. Uh, it could also be experimental. It's called the also experiment. So let's say that in software engineering, it's easier to find it called empirical evaluation. Uh, in HCI, that is a, a term, but also experimental evaluation because you experiment something, uh, or you can be also an observational uh, evaluation because you observe user doing things, doing tasks. But yes, it's 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 in the uh, empirical, uh, in a way, uh, domain. Um, and so you have different kind of, uh, as we're saying, the uh, of methods to involve user could be some more experimental. So you set up an experiment to do this, uh, some observational user. So you observe a user doing a task like for the um, observation in the need finding phase. And you can also have query methods. You can also do interviews. You can also do surveys. So all, all most of the things that we have seen in the need finding, uh, phase for the involving user could also be used partially or with some edits, some modification for evaluating an interface. Mm -hmm. Again, you can have to prototype an interface and having a survey to reach out 1000 people and select uh, which is the most comprehensible uh, choices, maybe in visualization with, with colors or something like that. And you can also observe people while using a, a, um, a a user interface, a system in the wild or in the lab. And so that is similar to um, observation that we have seen. And typically after the usability evaluation, we will, we will uh, see this in this, in, this in this lecture in the next one, let's say this set of slides, you also have some kind of questionnaire. So some kind of interviews, some kind of, yeah, interviews, uh, short surveys also. Um, and. To, to collect information, to collect comments, to get some grade from the user to your uh, to your interface, to your system. So there is a plethora of methods that will can be also be put together and mixed together according to what to what to your uh, specific system to your specific goal for the evaluation. What do you want to know from this evaluation? If you want to know about usability, you can do something. If you want to know about acceptability, you can have uh, an, another set of strategies. And this is just, uh, uh, let's say, a recap. Uh, so moving away from the recap, let's speak for a bit about what does mean evaluation in the lab versus evaluation in the field. I have already said a bit, a bit about both, uh, but and, and we are going to focus on the evaluation in the lab for the remainder of the course, but knowing that evaluation in the field exists and has some advantages and disadvantages, it could be useful as well. So the evaluation in the lab has the advantages that the environment, the setting is fully controlled by you. You decide uh, which equipment are there. You decide that your application will be shown on a 27 inch monitor or uh, on a specific Android phone or video record the settings or uh, audio record things and so on. So you are, you are controlling in a way 
the environment and the experiment in the evaluation. You decide who come in, when come in, uh, and when everything is, is going, when the, the interactive system is working, and doing what, and so on. You have more control, let's say. As a disadvantages, uh, you sometimes uh, have some lack of context because you are pick, picking people from your target population always and put it individually in a room and you are creating an artificial environment for evaluating your system and your web application, your user interface. And so you're losing the context in which a user will use the application in the real world. If you are doing an application for checking if a, uh, if a bus is coming to a stop and you are doing a, an evaluation in the lab, you are uh, reconstructing the moment in which the bus may or may not come with the same with a certain delay. Uh, because you cannot take a bus station with running buses in a specific place. You have to go on the street to get the real environment in which buses can be late, cannot be late, and your application could be more or less precise, and the feedback that you give to the user could be more or less matched with the real world. You are constructing an environment. So this is a possible disadvantage, lack of context. Uh, in some places, in some way, in some cases is, um, it could be minimized easily, but it depends again on the type of the application on your goal. For, as an example, um, uh, an application that rely on real data, like for a bus station or something, bus stops and similar things, it could be a problem for an application to be used at home, uh, quietly uh, and so on. You, it could be less of a problem. Obviously in a home, you can have also people around the noises and distraction and so on that you cannot recreate. You don't want to recreate uh, in the lab. So first is advantages of the evolution of the lab lack of context and the second disadvantages is that it's difficult not impossible but it's difficult to observe several users cooperating and working together typically for evolution the lab you uh, have one person working on your with your application and so if you have something that is collaborative it's difficult to evaluate in the lab with respect to evaluate in the, let's say in the real world. So in this, in the field means in the real world, in the real setting where the application will be, uh, or the system will be deployed and running. Uh, obviously it's appropriated for different stages. So for before deploying the application could be very uh, useful to have an evaluation in the lab, to have a usability testing in the lab, uh, but it's also appropriate if the system location is dangerous or impractical. You want to uh, evaluate an application for astronauts on the moon. Obviously, you cannot go to the moon and uh, it's, it's quite impractical. And so you can uh, simulate what you want to, to do uh, in a lab. And it's also appropriate for constrained single user system that allow these, uh, in some way, this recreation of the environment in which the application, the system will go and will run. On the other side, the evaluation of the field, that is again, the evaluation that you can do uh, with the real users in the real world in their own settings, uh, has some advantages that is uh, a natural environment. You don't have to recreate anything. You don't, have, you don't need to recreate tasks because you are using the tasks that people are naturally doing or are doing anyway with or without your application. Uh, the context is there obviously, because you are in, in the environment, uh, even if as for normal observation, uh, the observation may alter it. Maybe you are not there looking at, at the people, at the person, but you have maybe an application that sometime send a notification and, and ask for comments or remind the user that it have to, to write something in some field. So it could be a little bit an alteration of the context. And also the user know that they are evaluating an application and they are using an application for a specific goal that is providing an evaluation and not for their own pleasure. So this, the context is 99, let's say 99.9% retrained, but 
uh, in some way it could be a little bit altered. And you can also do longitudinal studies, so longer studies, while the evaluation in the lab may last 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you can say, okay, I would like to see how this work for three months. And uh, among 1000 people in Europe, America, Asia, and so on. So you can really spread out and get a lot of information, a lot of different uh, evaluations for, for your application and for your system. Again, according to your specific goal and the moment. Uh, disadvantages is that you don't control the environment and since you don't control the environment, uh, people can have distraction, can, you can be, there is noise, uh, could be other kind of problem, the mobile phone is not totally compatible with your application or something like that. So some, some problem that can arise during the evaluation. Uh, but in particular, the evaluation in the field, say in the real world, is appropriate where the context is really, really crucial and you cannot really recreate that context in the lab because you, you need uh, some things that happen uh, in the wild um, or when you have several users cooperating together. So a collaborative application, a collaborative system and is also obviously appropriate for longitudinal studies or very, very long studies that span different people around the world or uh, with large numbers and for a long time. So this is the main difference between evolution in the lab and in the field that is again in the real world. And sometimes it's also called in the wild because you go in the wild uh, of your city or your place and and experiment these with users. So there is no right choice as always. Um, different goals bring to different uh, settings. So if you want to understand again, how uh, the, the impact of some kind of notification that your system is generating um, over one month, probably it's better at evaluation in the field. If you want to understand the usability of your system uh, maybe the more controlled or if the text of the notification is understandable, you can do an evaluation in the lab before. So they are as many other things that we have seen, seen in this course, or especially in the net finding phase, they are complementary. You can use one thing for uh, one specific phase and another thing for a further stage or with different goal, you have different choices. But obviously there, is, there are differences between the two. And we are going to focus on in the lab experiment, uh, in the lab evaluation. And we will speak about these two things starting from today. Uh, the usability or user testing, that is the topic of this lecture, and the controlled experiment, uh, which are that we are going to speak uh, probably closer to Christmas or in January, and over in January. So what are the differences between those two? Because there are significant difference. Uh, the usability, or also we will call it user testing or user evaluation uh, in a different way, but we mean this, it's anecdotally, mostly, and it's observation driven. And the idea, for usability testing is that uh, you, you want to say a sentence like, like this. Let's find someone, five people, 10 people, to use our application or system so that we will get some feedback on how to improve it. It's more focused on the usability of the application. So we have an app, let's find some people that can use the app for a while doing some task and collect some feedback so that we can improve the app and move on. The control experiment instead is scientific and is, while the usability testing is not, and is driven, given that it's scientific, it's tried to apply the scientific method and it's hypothesis driven. You formulate an hypothesis and you want to check that that hypothesis hold on your application uh, and typically the, the controlled experiment uh, is called controlled because you control the environment. You, so it's that is that is, is did in, in the lab. And you want to check 
again, that some choices is better in some way than another choice. So the sentence that you want to write or you want to think about in the control experiment is, we want to verify, because it's hypothesis driven. You want to verify that if a user of our app or system, whatever, perform a specific task, faster, better, with less, fewer error, et cetera, et cetera, then our competitor app. So we're going to do a parallel between this on the same task uh, with our, our application and another application that is on the same domain or with a version of our application with another version of our application. We have an hypothesis that single task on a single system or on a single version of a system and application, it's better in some way that we have to, to decide obviously before doing the control experiment and this better could be faster with fewer error with less, with less time and so on. Uh, on that task, on that specific version, that specific system with respect to another system or another uh, version of the, the system the application that is enabling the user to do the same identical task. So it's not, let's find someone that use our application and get some feedback on how to improve it. But it's more scientific, uh, as, as I said, and it's about, we have a goal, we have an hypothesis that our application doing this task is better, again, according to some metric, metric set criteria, uh, than something else. And we want to check that our hypothesis is true. And this is, uh, usability user testing is, let's say, widely used, let's say, the industry uh, war just to check uh, usability errors and main problems before to uh, deploy, let's say, the application or the system in the real world. Control experiment are, given that these are more scientific, are typically used more in research in which you want to understand the specific effect or specific choice on a specific task on something. And so you want to verify that, I don't know, the creation of a, a post on Twitter is easier, quicker, better, faster than the creation of a post on Facebook. Or that the, I don't know, the, the, the chat, writing a message, message on the chat on Zoom is creating fewer error than creating a message on the chat on the virtual classroom. And you are testing that hypothesis and you can discover that yes, the chat on Zoom is better, faster than the chat of the, the uh, sorry, create generates less error uh, than the chat on the virtual classroom, or you can discover the, the vice versa, that actually you are creating much more error with the chat in Zoom than the chat in the, in the virtual classroom. So these are the main differences. The first one is anecdotally. Get some people, try the application, get some feedback. It is structured. We will see now um, a, a process that you have to follow, some rules, some criteria, some metrics. Um, but the, the goal is evaluating different tasks of a system and application to get feedback and to improve the application. The other is more about, let's check the, if this specific task is better in my application or in another application or in a version of my application and, or, and in another version of application. It's more about comparison and it's actually scientific and hypothesis driven. So now we will focus about this and then we will see after controlled experiment. So usability testing. Usability testing typically produce cost saving in a system development um, and speed up main pro project because you are trying to get error to catch errors and problem before that your application is, is in the wild and is deployed and everybody use it for doing different thing. You, for usability testing, you need to recruit participant users uh, that should represent your user, your target user. 
or your target users. If you have more communities, more subset, more stakeholder, what do we call stakeholder in the previous phases of the, of the course? Uh, by making attention to some specific things while recruiting participants. And these are obviously very, very similar to the things that uh, we already seen for uh, need finding. So participants should represent the intended user community. And you have to pay attention to the background in computing, if relevant, and the experience with the task. If you are doing a web application for booking a train ticket, uh, you may be, that is, let's say, a general uh, service for the general population, you may want to have, uh, maybe you don't care too much about the background in computing, uh, if it's a normal website, uh, but you want to maybe to understand if a, an expert is a person that is used to use a, a, a computer, uh, does the task uh, better in some way than a person that never use a computer and rely on, on smartphone or something like that. So you, maybe you, you're interested in understanding if there are differences. Uh, and especially with experience with the task, you may want maybe some people that are usual user of, of the service that took trains frequently and also people that took trains uh, rarely just to check that uh, the, the, the application, the system, the user interface uh, answer the needs of both group. And you can have also more than two groups, just, just, just an example. So when you're recruiting people, you have to pay attention to the background in computer and to the experience with the tasks uh, to the main goal that the application is going to, or the system which is going to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And also you have to consider uh, the motivation, uh, the education and the ability with the language that you use in the interface. If you are doing an interface in Italian, you cannot recruit people that don't speak or read Italian because obviously they cannot use the application and they will found a lot of problems. But you are interested in evaluating an interface in Italian, so you are not interested to that, even if those people are your target population. And similarly, if you are using some specific words, et cetera, you may be interested in different education. And or in the motivation, if you are doing an application to, for instance, reduce the usage of social media, you may be uh, want to recruit people that are already motivated to reduce the, the time on social media that are our expert user. And we also people that are not motivated to see if the application resound in them in the same way that uh, for the expert user. So you have just, when recruit people, when asking people to, to use an application, you have to consider this. It's in our target population, which is the experience of these people in the task. And it, we are fine that we, are, we have different experience in the task. Probably yes, probably no. Um, sometimes you are all interested in the expert user, so you are going to recruit experts. In other case, you want to recruit novices and experts, and maybe you don't want people in between. Uh, or, or if you want people in between, you have a considerable number maybe of people in between. And you can also balance for motivation, education, and obviously the ability of use the language that is in the interface if it's just for um, one, uh, one language in the user interface. All of these started more or less in the same time, uh, a little bit before actually, than usability test in the heuristic evaluation. And so if you remember from heuristic evaluation, we have said that uh, it was a quick way uh, not to spend a lot of money uh, for companies to test uh, an evaluation because you just take five uh, experts and you probably have done uh, instead of recruiting more people and spending money building labs. And this spending money in building labs was mainly referred to usability testing uh, usability labs that were built for usability testing. So usability testing could be done without specific, specific ad hoc labs, but 
sometimes you have specific labs, rooms that are equipped to do a great variety of usability testing. Uh, uh, usability testing. So this is a picture of a let's say possible typical usability testing lab. So it's it's basically a room that is split into uh, into part. Uh, there is one part that is the testing room, in which we have the user that is testing, in this case, a uh, computer-based application. And there is uh, maybe a paper in which the user can write, can read the task that, he have, that the, she has to do. Uh, and, and you see the room is quiet. There is no people around. There is no observer. There is anybody there, just the user, the task, and the application of the system. Then you have a glass, uh, the, like in the, the police uh, movies. Uh, and behind this glass, there is the observer. There is another portion of the room that is the observation room. Uh, in the observation room, you have a, a, a series of uh, instruments for guiding and for collecting information about what's going on in the testing room. So here we have just one observer, there is a microphone. If it needs to, to communicate something uh, with the, the user, you have cameras here, you see that the user has some cameras and probably this is video and audio recorded and you have some data from the application that the user is using. And then here you have other data coming from the application, it could be maybe time or errors generated or how many, in which task the user has. So you have a mix of uh, automated uh, measure and uh, subjective, let's say qualitative measurement that is taking and the observation of the, the observer that is maybe sometime interacting with the user in case of problem or for get started the session or for completing the session and so on. So typically in a usability testing lab, the testing room is smaller than the other and, and the usability, the testing room uh, accommodate just uh, very few people, typically one uh, per time. And while the, the observation room could be bigger and accommodate more people, maybe not just one observer, maybe one observer that also guide a bit the test and other people that take notes or observe different aspects specifically. Obviously, all of this could be done without. So this with less you could be done without this equipment. Um, but the idea is here is that the server does not influence the context of the of the user. Uh, while without a lab, you will have probably the server here or close to the user. Uh, but it is not a big difference because you know the user know that there is another room uh, behind the glass and that. And there is somebody there that look at uh, their activity. So it is not uh, uh, a big, dif uh, enormous difference. The main difference is that this room is a keep, so you can have a lot of uh, usability testing and you can have cameras, microphone, and all this thing already set up and ready to be used. While if you don't have a usability testing lab, you have to bring the equipment that you need time for time. Obviously, we are not going to, to use a usability testing lab. We don't have usability testing lab, especially in this, in this period in which everything is remote, but we are going to do usability testing on your final uh, prototype uh, with observer, with note takers in a, let's say, more traditional way. Uh, but you need some equipment, some specific equipment. So this is the introduction of usability testing. What how can we do? Which are the steps for completing the usability testing? So the first step that is probably the most important is the planning phase. That, and we are going to do an exercise on this phase. And the planning phase is the most important because you are going to decide who are the participant. You are going to decide which are your tasks that you want to test, how much they are, we have three tasks, we have 100 tasks, which is, the, let's say, the right number. Uh, where we are going to do this uh, usability evaluation? 
how, which equipment we are going to use and which data we want to collect and so on. Then the second step after planning is running, gives a bit of testing. Uh, as I said before, typically one participant at a time, multiple sessions. So you have five people, one part, the person number one do the usability evaluation, then you say hello to person number one and welcome person number two and et cetera. So one participant at a time, multiple session until the end of your uh, usability testing. Uh, and while it runs, you have to collect the data about the interactive system interface with the methods and the criteria that you decided and the equipment that you decided in the planning phase. And this equipment could be a camera if you need to, to record the user, but could also be uh, instrumenting the application so that you know how much time it passes from the beginning of the start and the pressing of specific button or other things like that. So information that you can easily derive from uh, the system, the running system. And after running the entire uh, usability testing, one participant time, you have to collect information, analyze, summarize uh, information, extract data from, extract insight and feedback from the collected data and proceed, decide how uh, the information that you get uh, impact the, the application, the system that you're going, that you are, that you designed and you implemented. So which changes again, you are going to do in your application to solve the problem that emerged from the usability testing. Mm -hmm. uh, so to be clear, we are going to ask you for milestone number four, to plan, run and analyze uh, the usability testing of your application with a limited number of people in your target population. Uh, but we are not going to ask you to uh, apply all the changes stemming from the usability evaluation in your application. Maybe the most relevant, yes, could be useful for, for the exam, but uh, the, the milestone number four mainly focus on planning, running, and analyzing the, uh, the usability testing. Similarly to, the, to what we ask you about the risk evaluation, the plan, how you run the risk evaluation, and which are the results and the list of changes. With the difference that after the risk evaluation, you have, uh, the, the course is, is still there. So you have to continue to work on your prototype. Like, instead for the usability testing, the course is at the exam, so you have, completed the work about the prototype. Uh, but uh, it, let's say in the real world, uh, outside of university course, if you have a prototype, an interactive prototype, you can use the information for the usability testing to amend the prototype and move the prototype uh, towards the production version of your application, your system, including the usability testing. And then you can have another usability testing when the, um, uh, when the application, the system is or is almost ready to be deployed, just to check if the changes that you've made make sense or not, and to check if you have other introduce other problem during the implementation, the final implementation, or everything is fine, and so on. So, as always, all these things can be used multiple times in multiple stages, including usability evaluation. So, step number one. Again, if you have any question because something is not clear or is too much clear, uh, the chat is there. Planning, that is the biggest part that we are going to cover about usability evaluation. So the first thing that you need to do in planning is choosing your participant, like we did, like you did for the, the, the need finding. So who are? you are target user, your system. So in our case, in your case, probably it's, uh, there are the same people that you uh, speak about or some, the same category, same target community uh, of the person that you spoke, speak about, spoke with um, during the need finding phase or the observation and the interview. So, but in general, the first thing is asking, okay, is asking, I am almost ready to do this Usability evaluation, 
who are the target user that we are going to recruit. And considering all the things that we have said before, are we interested in their expertise with computing? If this is an interactive computerized, let's say system or application, are we interested in the expertise with the task? We want expert with the task, we want novices, we want both uh, or variation in between. Uh, are we interested in their education, in their motivation to use the application or not? So depict, decide who are the target user. Then the second question is, okay, identify the target user, how many of them do we need? So according to, again, Nielsen, uh, this is the same website of, of Nielsen when we found the uh, heuristic evaluation. If you read that, that, that article, uh, Nielsen did a let's say, similar uh, experiment than he did for the heuristic evaluation and find that five is again, is, also, is in this case, the number of participants you need to, uh, to, to get most of the usability issues. So five participants is a sufficient number to get most of the usability problem. With more people, you can find some other issues, some other usability problems, but most of the, of the problem that other people after five will find will be including in, in the issue that the first five person will uh, find, uh, I've, I've found in the past. So five people will, of your target user, uh, maybe in some group, so you can have five experts and five not experts if needed, but these five people will be sufficient for uh, collecting most of usability of the biggest, at least, uh, usability problem. And, and you want to, to know more, you can read this. Uh, but five is, in this case, the magic number. So target user, who they are, how many of them we need? Five. Um, then if it's six, it's not a problem, but you'll say five is the, the enough number. Um, and then decide who in the team is going to conduct the usability evaluation. So you have decided your target user, you, have, you, you know that you have to recruit five people and you know, maybe also you start to, to list who they are, these five people that you can ask to, to come in a specific date, in a specific time, on a specific place, virtual or not, and conduct the evaluation. And then you have to decide who is doing, who is conducting, who is guiding the evaluation. So you have to decide who and which role you are going to play in the evaluation. You are not going to, to test the system, but you are going to maybe conduct and guide and observe the evaluation. And you need at least a single facilitator of the session, the one that welcome the user, present the task, give information, uh, help in case of uh, problems, uh, big problems with the system, the application, everything is stuck and you need to, to, to make it work again, something like that. And typically other one or two people may serve as note taker and observer. So people that observe what is happening and take notes about some specific aspects. Maybe the user is doing a very complex path for uh, an operation that in the mind of the developer and the designer was very, very easy, but you see the user doing strange thing and completing the task, even if completing the task, and you maybe, you can take note that this is something strange that you are, didn't expect to, to happen. And if this is happening for multiple time, uh, for multiple participants, that could be a strong signal that there is something wrong in that specific a process for fulfilling that task. So one facilitator, one to people as note taker and observer so that they can, uh, at, let's say one is the minimum, two, two could be a better number because you can so observe different things and take notes on different things so that if one observer is taking notes on a specific task and the other can observe what that was happening and if something smaller uh, happened, that could be uh, noted as well. 
and typically or, or better always with the exception of of your cases developer designer creators of the application or the interactive system can serve as note taker and observer but must not serve as facilitator so the developer and application the designer of the application the creator in any sense of that application that was involved with the creation the prototype the, the application the system have not to do the facilitator because the facilitator is the one that is speaking with user that is guiding user and the developer the designer know better than others how the system work how the application work and can introduce some bias uh, during the evaluation can give a suggestion to the uh, to the users to the participant how to do things if the the, the participants are so, um, has some problem and so it's partially invalidating the the test because it has they all, all of them developer design creators and so on are a deep knowledge about how the system how the application work specifically so typically the facilitator is an expert uh, a usability testing expert that is recruited from outside and that have an overview of uh, of the system that can generate the task etc but is not part of the team of the developers and creator of the application the system while not taker and observer since they don't interact at all with the user with the participant can also be part of the team in, in our case we will we are going to ban this rule obviously and we will have one person of the team in your prototype working as facilitator but with the idea that in any case this facilitator should provide only the minimum information that are required not providing suggestion not helping the user get unstuck on task because it's not their role even if they know how the system work that this is to be clear so uh, choosing who are the target user how many of them who are specifically so that you can make an appointment with them and then decide that one who is the facilitator who are the observer the note takers and so on then choose which task the facilitator is going to ask the participant to perform and you can generate this task uh, with the task analysis for instance or you can generate this task in another way um, sometimes it's useful to introduce task with a scenario so a brief explanation of the context maybe in which the task is inserted uh, it depends on the task obviously uh, and task similarly to, to the one that you generated for the heuristic evaluation must be concrete and with a clear goal, a clear goal so something that you can say at the end this task was successful or this task was not complete at all so with a clear goal concrete but without telling the user the participant how to complete the task so a task could be buy a train ticket for today starting in Turin and going to Alba. That could be a task with a lot of detail because maybe you are interested in checking how the time is taking place in this, in this process. So because the time is mandatory, you have to start today from, from a place. You have to insert where, when you want to buy the ticket is for today or for tomorrow. So concrete with a clear goal, you know that the task is completed if uh, the, the participant buy a ticket for today from that starting point to that end point in any time of the day because you don't specify the time, but should not, must not be something like uh, press the button by and select a date that is today and then insert the name of the city so you don't have to provide instruction how to complete the task you have to say do this with a clear goal and with all the needed information 
that are mandatory or, or you want to, uh, to investigate, not telling the user how to complete the task because otherwise you are cheating. And how many of these? So as a, as a rule of thumb, uh, a usability testing typically includes between five and 10 different tasks. This is a, a range. So if, if tasks are 12, it's fine as well. Uh, if there are four, probably are, are a little bit too few. Uh, if there are 100, it's, it's problematic. There are too many tasks because you don't want, you want to focus again on the main task of your application on exploring the main possibility on your application. If your application has so many tasks, you have to split the application in different sections because you don't want that the, the user is exhausted at the 100th task. And that is doing the, the last task worse than the first because you have asked the, the user to, to stay in front of a computer for three hours for completing a task, a series of tasks. So between five or 10 plus, let's say one or two in, the, in that range, around that range, five to 10. Then you have the user, you have your roles, you have a series of tasks written with some, let's say, criteria of, or with that, with, that you know how this task can be completed or not. And you can choose to apply any methodology to all the tasks, to a subset of the task, to just one task. And this methodology, we will see a few of them uh, next week uh, or after. Um, there are, for instance, think aloud, cooperative evaluation, or, or nothing. And you can say task number one is nothing, as, as no, met no special methodology, just do the task. And for task number two, instead, you are interested in the applying the think aloud methodology while the user, while the participant is doing the task. And finally, define your metrics for the evaluation and for each task which are the criteria for success or failure of the task. Totally success, totally failure, or something in between could be also reasonable. So the task is completed, but not 100%. The participant bought the, the train ticket, in the example that I, I did before, uh, but not for today, for tomorrow, or not from the right end place. So the task is, let's say, completed, the user bought the train, the train ticket for, let's say, today uh, for going to Alba, but not starting from Turin. So this is probably, according to your goal, again, could be a complete task with issues. So 90% complete task, 70% complete task, it depends uh, of the impact of the, cho the choice of, of the city on the interface. Uh, that's why it's important to define concrete and clear task according to your user interface and your uh, and the needs the main goal of the of the application of the system and uh, or this could be a failure because it's it's really important that they select all the things uh, correctly but you have to define for each task those criteria which are the criteria for totally success totally failure and in some cases also uh, partial uh, failure for what? For then extracting information, for getting feedback and apply this thing, derive choices from this information, from this data. So you choose the user, you choose your role, um, you select task, you select criteria, you decide to apply some methodology to some task and no methodology in other task. You are you haven't finished for the planning, you still need to do three things. The first one is decide whether you need or want to ask additional information, uh, additional to, to the task hmm, that the user is going to do. So you may want to do an interview hmm, to ask some question before the test or after the test or both. Maybe you want to collect uh, those um, information about education, expertise with computers, background of the participant before doing the test. 
And after the test, you maybe are interested in a grade for the entire application. From one to five, tell me how uh, usable you, you found this application or useful you find this application, for instance. But you can also want to get some information before or after each task or some of the tasks. So a questionnaire at the beginning, a questionnaire at the end, and or a questionnaire after a specific task, for instance. So you have to decide which information, additional information you need to bet, either better characterize your target user, uh, your population that you are uh, investigating with this uh, usability testing, and to collect additional information that can be useful for uh, going forward with your user interface. Then, now that you have criteria, now that you have matrix and task and all the things, you have to select which equipment you will need. Obviously, with respect to the criteria about the task, the methodology, the information, and so on, you need to print uh, tests. You need to create an online survey for collecting this information. You need a camera for recording the session or not, or you just need a microphone and you need a 27 inch monitor or a smaller monitor. Uh, you need a tablet, a smartphone, all the things that you need to actually doing the, um, the test. And you, in this equipment, uh, you can also decide to change something in your application to collect information while the user is using the application. As I said before, you maybe are interested in the time that is needed to complete one task to another. Or you are, uh, I don't know, uh, you are creating some task uh, for which you need a specific setting, a specific appearance or some specific information in the user interface that you don't have in the other task. So for task number seven, let's say, uh, you press a button and the user interface change uh, the content so that the user can do the task number seven. Hmm? Just, just an example. Uh, so you may want to keep the application with specific uh, data collection information or specific or a specific appearance or you want in a specific task, a notification appear. And so that notification must be triggered in that specific moment when the user press something or when you press something, you need to keep your uh, prototype, your user interface, your system to show that notification in the right moment you're in the evaluation. Because otherwise you are, if it's show up in the wrong task, you have some problem because you cannot do the task that involves the notification. So you may need uh, equipment, hardware equipment around you but you can also need to keep this, the prototype for collecting data or presenting a specific scenario, specific uh, settings for conducting better your, uh, your user evaluation and your um, collect better the matrix that you are interested in. And finally, you have to prepare an informed consent form for participants. So when you recruit participants, they have to know what is uh, what they are going to do, that they are not subject to that is if that something bad happen is in the user interface in the system is fault of the system is not their fault. Uh, that I don't know the recording is you will not publish the video recording if you did video recording uh, on the internet and create. I don't know, on YouTube and use this information against the user, against the participant and so on. So a uh, consent form which the participants say, I agree to participate in usability testing. I know how long it, it, it will be, what I'm going to, to do. Uh, I am free of any problem that may, uh, may arise and I agree to the video recording or to the audio recording uh, that people are doing, but 
they all the, the people that are doing the video recording, etc., are not allowed to share this or not to share my name or my personal information. So all, all these things. A constant form before starting the test, in which the users say, in which the participants say, I agree to do this test, I understand the risk, I understand the benefits, I understand the goal. So we can proceed. If the participant doesn't uh, sign up the consent form and is not informed uh, of what will going to happen in the test, the participant needs to be uh, needs to withdraw the test. The, the test. So you cannot use, you cannot proceed with the testing with a participant that don't want to sign up a consent form because it's it's a violation. Also from a law point of view. A question, is it possible to test shortcut as defined in the heuristic seven in this usability testing? Since the user doesn't have previous knowledge on the application or much time to explore or even interest in doing it, since they're asked to do the task and probably they will not, they will use the non shortcut way and not explore the functionality anymore. Uh, so it's, let's say that it's not, it's difficult, I agree with you that it's difficult to uh, test shortcuts because you, it's difficult that you can create a task for uh, the shortcut, for having the user use the shortcut. Uh, but it may happen. So while you're doing the task, so you're doing a specific task and maybe the user guess or understand that there is a different way or imagine or just do this in a different way and this different way is a shortcut in the end. So the application is supporting a shortcut uh, because maybe it's, it's not something, I don't know, if it's copy and paste, let, let's make an example of a shortcut uh, with, with a keyboard. And um, maybe that is a shortcut that came from many other application. And so you, you may happen to, to see uh, this shortcut in action. Or it's a shortcut that is very, very similar to what happened in an application that is like a competitor uh, of closely related to your system. And maybe this user know about this application, they use this application. So they try to do the same thing that uh, they are try to do typically in their own application, their own system. So I agree with you that it's difficult to test specifically shortcut, but doing a task, it's possible that they discover or try to use some shortcut that is possible. So uh, <clears throat> after you decide all of these things, you have still three things to do in the planning, and then we will go in deeper in some of these this topic. So you decide a new user, you decide which role you have, the task, the criteria, the matrix, the equipment, you prepare the informed consent form, you decide the methodology for each task, etc. Then you have to decide if you want a debriefing session at the end of the test or not. So maybe it's enough to have a questionnaire at the end of the test, or maybe you want a debriefing session in which uh, the note taker and the observer can make question about the thing that they observe. This is typically done because the observer cannot something that the user is doing, maybe the user is not aware of it or have done this. And so it could be useful to have uh, a conversation why, about, I, I noticed that you did this, uh, why? And maybe the user say, I, I don't know, it just was the, the normal way of doing, or maybe there is some reasoning that the user still remember and can convey. And it could be useful for, again, getting feedback and proceed with changes to your application. So you can decide if you want to have a debriefing session for each participant and the other the test um, to, to better understand something that happened. So after deciding all of these things, the next step is write. You're going to write a test protocol that is typically called script for ensuring consistency among sessions. So a script that the facilitator is reading. 
So every participant will receive exactly the same information than all the others, starting from good morning and ending to thank you, now you can go. So that every background information that is provided to a, to a participant is given to all the other participants. You don't risk to forget to say something or explain better one thing with one participant than another because it passed one week and you don't exactly, the facilitator don't exactly remember what uh, he has said. So for usability testing, you typically write a test protocol, a script, which includes all the information that we uh, have mentioned before, the task, the criteria, the matrix, the equipment that you need for let's say internal use, for the, the use for, for the team, for the facilitator, and also a step-by-step -step instruction uh, for the facilitator to provide the user, the participant, every participant the same information. So welcoming the user, providing a background information of what is the system and application about, handling the uh, informed consent form, then handling another piece of paper that is the initial questionnaire, then handling another piece of paper that is uh, the, the, the list of the task that the user is going to do, or just the first task the user is going to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, and often this script for the external part, not for the list of, of tasks and criteria, is uh, the exact word the facilitator will say. So the facilitator will read the background information, the introduction, essentially. Again, to ensure consistency, to give all the participants the exact same information. So after you develop this script, there could be also with all the tables for tasks and so on, could be also five, 10 pages long. Uh, the, the things that typically is done before doing the, the real usability testing uh, with your target population is to do a demo session. Uh, so practicing the script, practicing all the plan and the application and the system with some friends or some colleagues, maybe also just one or two people to find bugs or to find problem, find unclear uh, steps. Maybe you discover that after task number six, you cannot do task number seven because the information, the application is not coherent for task number seven and you didn't find about it, but you discover with a friend or colleague, uh, something like this. Um, and this is important because if you start the, the user evaluation with people with participant with the real participant and then you discover at participant number three that there is uh, a significant problem with one or more task or with some information that you are you are giving to the user you have to let's say find other three participants because the first three probably are the information that came out from the first three could be problematic so you are losing yours and your participants time in this way so a quick practice session before doing the actual usability testing to evaluate that everything works, everything works well, that the information that the camera is recording, that uh, if you keep your application, all the data is recorded in the proper way for the entire duration of the test, not just for a one minute test and so on. So let's start from the, uh, the, all of these, there are some parts that needs more explanation. So the choice of task, it's it's similar to what we you did for the risk evaluation for task analysis. We already spent a bit about task, and so we we, we will need to uh, focus a bit on the methodology, the criteria, and the metrics, and uh, this additional information and the informed consent form, which is the details for which are the details for these things and let's start with informed consent form so the consent informed consent form as i told you before is a practice uh, here it's written a professional ethics practice but it's also in some cases mandatory by, by law for instance by gpdr uh, but as a practice in any case is to ask participant all participant to read, understand, and sign. So they have to sign a statement, a piece of paper 
let's say, first of all, I have freely volunteer to participate in this experiment, in this usability testing. It's not that somebody uh, forced me to do this against my will. Second, I have been informed in advance before starting the evaluation what my task will be and what procedure will, will be followed. So here it doesn't mean that she had, that the participant had to see the entire list of tasks, the exact task that they are, uh, the participant is going to, to do during the evaluation, but that she know uh, which is the goal of the of the, of the survey that maybe there are 10 tasks, then uh, the task will be about using a specific application, a specific domain, doing specific things. And then after each task, you will have a questionnaire or not. And then there will be 10 tasks and then all the things or everything will be video recorded and um, it will last 50 minutes. So all the information about how we'll how the usability testing will unfold up to the end. Third, I have, uh, I have been given, or I will be given the opportunity to ask a question in any time and have an answer for this question. So if the user, the participant has some doubt, he can obviously ask and you are expected to answer properly. Fourth, that the participant is aware that the participant can withdraw at any time from the, ta from the usability testing. So at task number seven out of 10, the participant can decide, I don't want to continue. And according to the form that you ask the participant to sign up, the participant data up to that point will be deleted. And you are not going to consider any of the information on the participant because the participant decide not to continue with the test for any reason that came to their mind. And without prejudice to any future evaluation. So if you need to recruit this participant again for another test or a different application, you can do this. Even if this person uh, discontinue the participation in a previous test. And lastly, that the signature that this, this person is expected to sign uh, this piece of paper with this information uh, means that the participant agree, read, agree, understand all the previous information. And all these must happen before starting the study. So you welcome the participant, explain maybe the domain because you need to, to explain this, uh, the, which task will be and what procedure will be followed. And then you give the informed consent form. The participant reading con the, the consent form, ask you any question that uh, the participant may have. And then if the participant agree what is written there, sign the form and you can proceed with the first survey about uh, background information, the age, the, the education level, whatever, the expertise with specific tasks and so on. Before that moment, the participant cannot see anything about the, the task and usability testing, just a brief introduction to explain what the test is about. And I have here an example, a really recent example, of um, a consent form. This is quite long. And this is for, this is, this was that, this was for a survey. So it's a slightly different because for a survey, uh, you collect a lot of data, a lot of information, uh, probably more than for usability testing. Uh, a survey made at Polytechnical a few months ago. Uh, I, I, I participated in the survey as I saved these for, mainly for the course. <clears throat> and this is a equivalent of a, a informed consent um, according to the GPDR. GPDR. 
So, but you may find that some, most of these topics here are also reported here. So here there is an introduction. Uh, so this was an online survey. Uh, so they need to uh, put the name of the people, the email address of the people and a brief introduction. Uh, if there is a usability um, testing and we, you have the opportunity to speak directly with person, some of these information can be provided also by voice. Uh, maybe here you can have just a shorter version of this. Then you have research objective and benefits. So I've been informed in advance what my task will be and what procedure will be followed. So which is the goal of this uh, survey in this case and which are the modalities and which is the duration of the survey. And notice that there are some uh, thing that is right to say like in general, there are no right or wrong answer. And this also applies for the usability testing. There are not, let's say, right way to use the application or wrong way to use the application. So something like this could be. Then I am freely volunteer to participate. Voluntary participation. The participation is absolutely voluntary. The participant is free not to fill the, the questionnaire without penalty or repercussion. I am aware that you have the right to withdraw consent and to discontinue participation in time. So you see all, all this stuff is basically also reported here. Then here it's explained how to participate in the study uh, that in a, because it's an online survey again, in a uh, usability testing you are in person. Uh, so it's, it's easier uh, to, to explain thing. And this could be also put together with these modalities and duration if you want. And then there is a section that is uh, mandatory for the GPDR, uh, especially that is the risk and potential benefits of the study. So saying which risk the participant is going through, and this is not included here uh, actually, but this is about saying to the participant which risk, if any, and benefit, if any, uh, the participant can uh, derive or may encounter for participating in this survey or in this usability evaluation. Because obviously if you are testing a user interface, maybe you don't have big risk, but if you are doing usability testing, um, I don't know, uh, something that emits radiation or on a drug uh, or something like, this category of thing, you also have some risk, some physical risk from the participant. So in this case, it's, you know, they say the study uh, does not foresee any greater additional risk than those that human encounter in their life, because they have to, to just click on buttons on a, on a survey. So it's not something really uh, that has a lot of risk. Then here there is a sponsor that in most of cases there isn't, there isn't. And then there is contact data that is requested for uh, GPDR. Uh, so who, who are the person to contact here at, in this case at Politecnico di Torino, not at, not, not at the level of the people that are doing the survey, but it's higher level. And this is basically, uh, let's say standard uh, with that, that uh, you know, recall the GDPR and explain the data transfer when the data is processed. This is online survey with Google. So obviously data is in the Google server somewhere in the world. It's not on a server in Italy or at Polytechnic. So they need to explain this thing and what happened to the data at the end of the search, at the end of the study, at the end of usability testing. If you are collecting video recording, you have to, to write some, to be compliant 100% with GDPR, you have to write something like that. And the, the rights of the participant that have on this data. So according to the GDPR, for instance, you can ask in any moment uh, in the next few years, uh, I don't remember, I don't know if it's Britain here, uh, to delete this data. So I joined, I participated to this survey three months ago. Next year, I can ask Polytechnico, please delete my information from this uh, survey. Obviously, if you can, like in this case, track no, 
have a hidden identifier between a user and the information that they provide. And if you have any claim, you can reach the privacy guarantee at this address and so on. So most of this thing is standard for Europe at least. Other things are more to be personalized a little bit, but essentially this is the longer form. Again, for an online survey made on Google, uh, product that is very that is quite different from um, in-person uh, usability testing uh, but you see also there there are all this information are there so typically uh, if you don't if you don't need or or, or want to specify all this thing uh, the uh, an informed consent is typically shorter than this uh, it's not four pages is maybe one or two page this is just an example. Again, for an online survey, quite long, I don't remember, 20 minutes. So quite up, quite long with videos and uh, a lot of things, uh, but uh, for, that you don't have typical usability testing. Uh, but again, if you are collecting personal information, the name, the surname, collecting the video, et cetera, you have to, in, say, in the real world, you have to be compliant with uh, GPDR and all, all the information, especially if you are going to use this information to do something. In this case of this document, it was for uh, then using this information for research purposes of writing a scientific paper, publishing a scientific paper. So you have to ensure that uh, your data of your participant will not go. Uh, so in this paper, it, they will not say that I, that Luigi de Russis did these choices and answer this question in this way and so on. And this consent form, this policy form, uh, tell me and them that uh, if I notice this, they uh, are violating this form. And if they are doing this, they are violating their own things. And there are uh, there is the law at a certain level that asks for clarification and changes. So this is surely professional ethics practice, even if there is no law, but if you have a law, you can also do something a little bit more complex than this. So tomorrow we will continue from here, not tomorrow, next week we will continue from here speaking about matrix. It's 1 p.m. and one minute, so we are late. Uh, tomorrow there is the lab in two, round as always uh, you will do uh, uh, supervised work group so you can implement your prototype but especially we will discuss a bit about the feature that you're going to use from your mobile phone in your uh, prototype and this afternoon i will publish the uh, public repository some github that can serve as an example for integrating the sensor mobile phone mobile phone in a uh, um, uh, web-based user application. So you can start from that and we will briefly discuss about those things, those are repositories, those project tomorrow in the lab. I'm stopped the, the recording and while I'm stopping the sharing and everything else, if you have any question, please write in the chat. Otherwise we will uh, speak and we will talk tomorrow on Zoom.